and welcome to this year's Anne Spencer Memorial Lecture. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Ed Davis and I'm the Anglican and Coordination Chaplain here at the University of Bristol. And I'm really pleased to be able to welcome you all here this evening. I know members of the university and members of the wider community as well. A number of you will be familiar with this annual event organised by the Chaplaincy on behalf of the Spencer family. It seeks both to remember Anne Spencer, a much-loved daughter and sister and academic colleague, and to facilitate discourse between Christian theology and contemporary issues, and to do so here within the context of higher education. Tonight is the 22nd such Anne Spencer Memorial Lecture. Themes in previous years have included faith in the environment, faith in economic justice, spirituality and psychotherapy, and Christian-Muslim relations, and maybe some of you caught some of those over years gone by. For this year's event, we are, we've been keen to focus on hopes for peace in the Holy Land. We've chosen this subject because it's an issue of concern for so many, and perhaps particularly for members of the Abrahamic faiths who regard that land as holy who long for peace in the birthplace of their religion, and who identify with the pain of their brothers and sisters in faith who live there. But the concern also goes beyond what is happening in the Holy Land, as we see the impact of the situation there on community relations much closer to home, including here in Bristol. I imagine, and indeed hope, that many different perspectives will be represented here tonight. Perspectives that have perhaps been shaped by experiences in Israel or in the Palestinian territories, by those that we've spoken to over the years, by the narratives we've heard, by the media, by our theology and our politics. This is an opportunity to explore together something that is a wide, widespread concern. Universities should be communities where big issues can be discussed safely and openly. And that is my hope for this evening. So often we hear that religions are part of the problem. I'm keen to explore this evening how they can be a resource for peace, particularly when working together. And that is reflected in the structure of this evening's event. I'll introduce Sammy, our speaker, properly in just a moment. But just to explain, first Sammy will be giving his talk, then we will have time to ask him questions, and finally we'll be ending the evening by hearing briefly about a project here in Bristol that has been facilitating dialogue between faith groups on the subject of Israel and Palestine. And I'll introduce those who will be presenting that later on in the evening. So first, I'm delighted to welcome Sami Awad as our speaker this evening. I won't say too much about him now because I know that some of his story will emerge as he speaks to us. But just to give a very brief sketch, Sami was born in the US, but his family returned to Palestine when he was just a few months old and he then grew up in Palestine. He later returned to the US to study, gaining first a degree in political science, and then a Master's in International Relations. Drawing on Christian teachings and the legacy of a family committed to peace and reconciliation work, in 1998 he founded Holy Land Trust. This is an organisation based in Bethlehem, which engages with Israeli and Palestinian communities to promote non-violence as a means of ending all forms of conflict and establishing an enduring and comprehensive peace in the Holy Land. His work in this area continues, and he continues to be director, and has been recognised recently in his honorary doctorate of divinity awarded by the Chicago Theological Seminary in the States. I'm so grateful that Sammy has accepted the invitation to travel from Bethlehem to speak here this evening on the theme of creating a future of peace from a history of pain. Let's now welcome him as he comes to speak. Good 
Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. All right. Uh, thank you, Reverend Ed, for the invitation, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's a real joy and honor and privilege to be with you tonight. And, and what I'll do tonight is, is share my story, uh, share the journey of one person uh, who grew up in a situation of conflict and who is looking for how can we achieve a situation of peace and justice in a land where, as many of you know, hatred, anger, fear, and resentment have and continue to take uh, this course. And, and so what I'll do is share my story uh, to you. And uh, one of the interesting things about sharing stories is that there are two major components of any story that pretty much set the stage for the story when it's shared. The first is the title, and we already have the title set, so I don't have a choice with that. Uh, but the second is the opening line. You know. I, I know many authors who actually struggle so much in just coming up with the first words of the opening line because that sets the stage for the entire story that they write. And I used to have an opening line, like many Palestinians and many Israelis. It was actually a very similar line that both communities used when they shared their story. And the opening line that we all used to have, or many of us used to have when sharing our story was, in 1948, I think many of you know what happened in 1948, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, but if I share the story from a time of war, of conflict, of violence, I set the stage in that anything that preceded that, anything that came after that, is a result of war, conflict, and violence. So there was conflict that was happening before 1948 came as the... A volcano eruption of this conflict into a war. It feeds into the myth that many people actually speak when it comes to the conflict in the Holy Land, and maybe some of you have heard this, when they say this is a historical, intractable, ongoing conflict that's been going on for thousands of years. Since the time of Abraham's kids, we've been fighting each other, or those people have been fighting each other. And if something happened genetically, to the children of Abraham, where they actually, every generation comes out just wanting to hate, wanting to fight, wanting to kill the other. And you've heard this. People say this. It's been going on for thousands of years. As soon as you hear a conflict that's been going on for thousands of years, one of the things that might happen to you is say, well, what can I do about it? If it's been going on for thousands of years, then there's nothing that I can do about it. So... By starting a narrative from an opening line of conflict, we set the stage that this is all about conflict. Recently, I began to share my story with a different opening line. The opening line is, before 1948. What was life like in the land before 1948? And the model that I use is the neighborhood that my father was born in and grew up in, a neighborhood called Musrara which is right outside the old city walls of Jerusalem. This neighborhood, to the surprise of many, when you hear this, was a neighborhood that actually had Jewish families, Christian families, and Muslim families live together as good neighbors. Many people get surprised when they hear this. What about this historic conflict? No. Yes, this land has witnessed many conflicts and many wars, like many lands around the world, but it's never been one ongoing war and conflict. We've had many times and many moments of peace and tranquility between these communities. What's interesting about this neighborhood, like many other neighborhoods that existed in the land before 1948, was that the people that lived there were not sort of your, you know, secular, lefty, hippie, let's put religion on the side and let's deal, let's deal with these issues. They were very conservative, very religious, very orthodox, and they still got along with each other. My father shares stories uh, with us of how he, as a child, he was nine years old in 1948, so up until that time, we come from a Christian background, so the Christian children and the Muslim kids used to go into the Jewish homes during Shabbat. They didn't go into these homes to steal cookies from the cookie jars. They went into these homes because their job, every Friday evening, was to turn on and off the lights for these families and then turn on and off the ovens so that these families would have a warm meal. 
They didn't even know why they were doing this, but they listened to their mother. Go turn off the lights. Go turn on the lights for your neighbors. And that's, that's what they did. So I think one of the very important questions is to ask what happened. What happened that shifted that reality? And I'm not trying to claim it was utopia, it was perfect. There were many conflicts. There were many issues. A lot of the conflicts that actually happened between these religious groups were instigated by what was happening outside of the land, not inside the land itself. And I'll, I'll share a little bit more on this. 1948 did come, and the war happened. And the family, my father's family, suffered in the war. My grandfather was killed in the war. He was a civilian. He wasn't involved in combat. He was shot by a sniper. Uh, my grandmother and her seven children buried their father. And then a few days later, when the Jewish forces took over that neighborhood, the Christian and Muslim families were evicted, uh, were kicked out from their homes. Uh, so the family became part of uh, a term that you probably heard a lot, the Palestinian refugees, where close to 80% of the non-Jewish population of the land left their homes, were evicted from their homes, were scared out of their homes, for different reasons, left their homes, but all thinking that one day, very soon after the war, they will return. And so my grandmother took her seven children and moved into Bethlehem, where she had a brother that was living there. Again, with this idea that we will return once the war ends. And that, of course, has not happened. I, I share this story because part of it, is, of course, is to acknowledge the tragedy of what happened to the Christians and Muslims, to the non-Jewish population of the land during that time. But at the same time, to also specifically talk about the family itself. Uh, my grandmother was a faithful person. Uh, coming from a Christian background, she understood our faith to be a faith where we are called to be peacemakers. One of the statements that she always taught her children and us as grandchildren that we will never seek revenge and retaliation for what happened to us. Uh, that we will not achieve anything. Her husband won't come back. The property they lost won't come back. We won't be able to go back to Jerusalem if we engage in revenge and retaliation for what happened to us. But at the same time, as I said before, she also insisted that as a family, we will engage in proactively resisting violence, proactively seeking peace and reconciliation with those who have committed injustice to us. And that's the seed that she planted in the family. Jumping to my uh, story, I grew up after another major war, which is 1967. The 1967 war led to what we define as Palestinians, the military occupation of the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and Jerusalem. The Israeli military took over these areas, and they reinforced military orders and commands to control our life. So Israel was in control over the entire territory, but we were specifically under the, uh, the control of the Israeli military. And the Israeli military, during that time, continuously denied the basic human rights for the Palestinians. It wasn't just the physical presence and the oppression of the army that we witnessed, but also things like freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom to elect your own representatives or leaders, uh, freedom to voice your opinion, uh, freedom to open organizations like the organization that I, I run now, uh, freedom to determine where your tax money goes. All of these things were denied for us. So it was a very strict, brutal military regime that controlled our lives. And I grew up in that. I grew up almost on a daily basis witnessing the brutality of the Israeli army towards us as Palestinians. Towards my father, having being a child with him, going to a checkpoint, or being stopped by soldiers in the street, and having a soldier maybe just a few years older than me insult my father and my father not being able to do anything about it. Uh, I, I witnessed this. And so I grew up in a situation where I honestly say I had every excuse to hate Israelis for what they were doing to us. At the same time, I have this family who was taught me, seek peace and reconciliation. And I remember as a child even arguing with my father, how dare you ask us to make peace with them? Look what they just did to us. Look what they just did to you. They don't want to make peace with us. Why are you asking us to make peace with them? And it was very challenging. How do you bring two narratives that simply don't fit? with each other. 
there's occupation, there's oppression, there's military control of our lives, that has no connection with this idea of peace and reconciliation in the land. At the age of 12, an answer began to appear for me through an uncle of mine who had been living in the U.S. and came back and opened a center in Jerusalem to teach nonviolence to the Palestinians, uh, studying Gandhi and the liberation movement in India, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement in the U.S. My uncle, his name is Mubarak Awad, came in the early 80s and opened a center called the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence. And in that center, he began to promote nonviolent resistance and activism to the occupation. And through that work, I began to see that there is a bridge between a reality of occupation and oppression and a vision to seek peace. And that is through nonviolence. And so from the age of 12, I started participating in nonviolent activities that were organized by my uncle. Two things happened that shifted my life in being active with my uncle. The first is meeting Israeli peace activists. Uh, honestly, I would say until that point, I did not know people like this existed, because my only witness was to the Israeli army, or to another group of people that sometimes were even more violent than the army, known as Israeli settlers. And so this was my experience as a child growing up. All of a sudden, there are Israeli peace activists, Israelis who were not just sympathizing with us as Palestinians or having pity for us as Palestinians, who were standing with us, getting beaten up, getting arrested by their own military for justice for the Palestinians. And that opened my horizon to say, I have to break my stereotypes of how I perceive the other. The other thing that happened was in 1988, in the second year of what is known as the Intifada, which was a Palestinian uprising, a civil revolt against occupation, the Israeli government arrested my uncle, put him on trial, and deported him from the land, which was a policy that was commonly used at that time, usually for people who were violent. My uncle was the first nonviolent person to be deported, and he was labeled by the Israeli government as a threat to the national security of Israel. A nonviolent peace activist who worked with Israelis was seen as a threat to the national security of the state of Israel. And I was very much involved in the protests that were happening outside the prison. Uh, thousands of Israelis joined individuals protesting their own government for arresting this person. Uh, but at the end of the day, even when the U.S. protested against the deportation, my uncle was uh, deported. And for me, that was a big turning point in my life where I said, I really want to understand what is this thing called nonviolence? What is the power of nonviolence that makes a country as strong as Israel, see in my uncle, a one person, a peace activist who never carried a gun, a threat to its national security. And I began my journey to research and to study nonviolence. Of course, I ended up in the country that is the most nonviolent in the world, the U.S. <laughs> That's where I did my studies. And they actually have good teachers in nonviolence and peace studies over there. Uh, where I did my degrees and then came back uh, to Bethlehem in 1996. I came back during that time not interested in nonviolence, not interested in protests, not interested in demonstration, because we had something amazing happening, which was a peace process. You may have heard of the Oslo peace process, which began in 1993. And I came back, like many Palestinians and many Israelis, feeling this is it. This is going to be the end of occupation, this conflict is going to end, and we are going to live happily ever after, side by side, in a framework known as the two-state solution. The Palestinians are going to have a state on approximately 20 to 22 percent of the land. Israel is going to have their state on 78 percent of the land. And that's it. This is what this whole Oslo was all about, the two-state solution. And I came back to play my role in achieving this peace that was promised to us by our politicians. The reality struck me very quick. And it wasn't an insight that I had. If you, if you read for Palestinians and Israelis who really understood what this occupation is and what real peace and justice looks like, they were all, the, the voice of criticism for Oslo was beginning to emerge during that time. And the way I describe it was that Oslo was not necessarily a peace process 
as much as a negotiation process to try to restructure the occupation itself. Through creating new measures of security arrangements for the State of Israel, giving certain responsibilities to the Palestinians, uh, so now we actually do have those civil rights that were missing to us, we could shout as much as we want on how bad Israel is that we don't get arrested anymore. We could wave our little Palestinian flag. We could, every once in a while, once in a long while, elect uh, some of our leaders. And of course, the international community has to like them or not like them. Uh, we could open organizations like the ones I have. So we have sort of the basic civil uh, rights, or I would say autonomy uh, rights within the Palestinian community, but never really reaching statehood. One of the challenges, of course, of Oslo that triggered uh, the start of an organization like ours, there were two main challenges. The first one was the issue of the settlements. Uh, the settlements are uh, not just small housing projects. These are big communities, almost cities, that are built inside the West Bank, in the territory that was to be handed over to the Palestinians to establish their uh, state. The problem with Oslo was that during the years of the Oslo peace process, it did not matter which Israeli government, left or right, the settlement project continued at a faster rate than before the peace process began. Statistically, there were about 200,000 settlers in 1993. A big number, a number that needed to be dealt with, uh, but there was this idea that there will be some idea of how to deal with these settlers. The problem, by the end of the peace process in 1999, that number had doubled. That number has tripled now. Over 650,000 uh, settlers now live in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. And so these settlements are located in certain areas, strategic areas, that divide up and cut up the Palestinian areas from each other that make it difficult to actually create a state. And we were beginning to see this settlement expansion very strongly during these years. Another thing that triggered the launch of the organization was the fact that for me and my understanding of peace, peace was about bringing people together, bringing communities together, reconciling communities together. What we began to see in Oslo was actually the opposite. What's very interesting was that before the Oslo peace process began, Israelis and Palestinians had actually much more communication with each other than when the peace process began. All of a sudden, now as Palestinians, we needed to have permits in order to go into Jerusalem and into Israel. Israelis needed to have permits from their own military in order to come to us. Yes, every once in a while you had your sort of token uh, peace activity, peace project, bringing Israeli kids and Palestinian kids, usually the children of the elite, to come and talk with each other and take pictures with each other on the White House lawn or you know, in certain uh, recreation areas around the world. But at the grassroots level, there was more division and separation. I call it segregation, was taking place between the communities. And so, in 1998, the group of us came together and said, we need to do something about it. We are for peace. We are for ending this occupation. How can we do this? By encouraging communities. And so our slogan as Holland Trust was strengthening the communities for the future. Ultimately, it is about communities that make peace. Politicians will come and go. They'll be the right, they'll be the left. If the communities cannot maintain and sustain a peace, no peace will last. And so how do we strengthen the communities to be that voice that makes this peace happen? By 1999, in the second year of our work, the whole peace process collapsed. And we were in the beginning, in the year 2000, of what's known as the second Intifada, which unlike the first one, was one that was very violent. And both sides were violent. I'm not going to stand up here and say they were more violent than we were more violent. At the end of the day, both communities, civilians of both communities, suffered from the violence that was witnessed. And as an organization, we felt that now it is time to move back to this nonviolent resistance and activism. And so in the year 2000, our focus of our work was how do we go back even at a time when many Palestinians felt that armed resistance was the way to move forward to continue to argue for nonviolence, to continue to argue that nonviolence is the way that we should engage in. 
being rejected by many Palestinian groups at that time, and also being rejected by the Israelis for the work that we were doing, Israeli military and government specifically. And in that, the momentum continued to grow. And we continued to grow in our work, and we became one of the leading organizations in promoting nonviolence, either training, activism, strategic thinking, or direct action. Uh, if you came during that time and visited us on Friday, you wouldn't find us in the office because we would be demonstrating somewhere, getting beaten up somewhere, getting arrested somewhere, getting detained, getting shot at. That was the activities that we did during that time. And that continued for many years, and we were beginning to see momentum uh, grow on this. But then something happened in my personal life that began to create a shift in my own understanding of what peace looks like. As I said before, I come from a Christian uh, background. And, and many times it's very interesting how we, in our religions, put our political agenda before our faith agenda. How we have our political agenda lead our religious theology or religious spiritual understanding. If it fits in my political agenda, then I will push for this religious agenda. If it doesn't fit, I'll find a way to negate it, to sidestep it. I wasn't able to do this when I was reading the scripture once, reading the Gospels, and no matter what you think of Jesus, from the Messiah, to the prophet, to a crazy rabbi, one of the sentences that he said that really triggered in me a very powerful reaction was when he called his followers to love their enemies. What does that mean? What does it mean? If I want to follow this guy and his teachings, I cannot sidestep this first. Either I follow the whole thing, or I negate the whole thing. And for me, it started a journey to really begin to understand what does it mean for me as a Palestinian, living under occupation, living under oppression, to actually love those who are causing this. One of the things that I realized very early on as I was studying this verse well, the first thing was that it's a commandment. You know, it's not an option. He doesn't give you options on, you know, I would like for you to consider one day in your life loving your enemy. Or I hope one day you will reach a point that you will love your enemy. You want to follow, you want to follow me? I command you, love your enemy. The second interesting thing that is part of this statement was that he could have, in the context of the conflict at that time, which was the Roman occupation, of the Jewish people at that time, and there was resistance, and there was collaboration, and there was normalization, and there was all kinds of things happening very similar to what we are experiencing now, he could have easily said things like, I want you to negotiate a peace solution with your enemy. He could have easily said, I want you to reach a political agreement with your enemy. And many people would have rejected this. I want you to resolve your conflict with your enemy. He didn't say any of these things. He called his followers to love their enemy. And that began a journey for me to really begin to understand what, what does that mean. You know, the first thing I thought of was, what do I do now? Do I go around checkpoints and open my arms to the real soldier and say, come on, I love you, man. Give me a hug. You know you want it. Come on. I don't think I would get far with that. Part of understanding that concept of love, what I began to realize is that you need to know who your enemy is. To really begin to understand actually what makes the animosity. What makes them your enemy. It's easy for us sometimes to look at an individual or a group of people's action and define them as the action itself. It's very difficult to ask what is behind it. What is in the past that caused that individual to become a thief? To become a killer? Because we look at that person and we define them as a thief. Their identity becomes the thief. There's nothing more to that than a thief. And so I think what Jesus was calling me to do, and this is how I interpreted it, was to begin to understand, and even to go back to that neighborhood that my father grew up in and ask, what happened that shifted a reality where they actually got along with each other to what we are experiencing now? One of the answers came very quickly for me when I was invited by American Jewish friends of mine who were supporting our work in nonviolence to go on a retreat with them. And this retreat is called the Bearing Witness Retreat. 
and it's a retreat that happens in the death camps of Auschwitz and Birkenau in Poland. I don't know how many of you, if any of you have been there. I actually encourage people now to go and visit Auschwitz and Birkenau if they have an opportunity. And for me, it was a shock to begin to see what the Holocaust did to the Jewish community, and not just the Holocaust, centuries leading up to the Holocaust as well. I actually say, in Auschwitz, I discovered my enemy. My enemy is the story of pain, of trauma, of neglect that was never resolved, never healed. My enemy is the story of a community that had lost millions of people, but also a community that had lost trust in everybody else. When I was in Auschwitz, one of the things I witnessed, in addition to the historic trauma, was in seeing how much indoctrination into the ideology of trauma takes place for Israeli children. It actually broke me much more than seeing the, the trauma of the past when I heard Israeli teachers tell their children, and these are 13, 14, 15 year old kids who are there visiting these death camps, which I think is very important to learn the history, but one of the things that I heard them say continuously was, it is not over. The Holocaust is not over. We, as a Jewish community, are always threatened. We are always under attack. We always have to defend ourselves. We cannot trust anybody. We have to keep strong. You have to join the army at the right time, at the right age. Security, security, security is the only way that we can maintain our existence. And if that means oppressing us as Palestinians, then that comes with the deal because one thing I also heard these teachers say was statements like, if the Palestinians, if the Arabs, if the Muslims have an opportunity, they'll do to you what the Nazis did to your ancestors. This indoctrination into the narrative of fear was so strong. So I came back from that experience completely broken and really began to ask, was this political peace process worth anything that we were negotiating if we are not able to address these root causes of this conflict, if we are not able to heal the traumas of the communities, the trauma of the Jewish community and the Holocaust and what happened there, and the trauma of the Palestinian community and the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948. And in no way am I comparing the two. I'm just saying two communities experienced two major traumas in their life, and both traumas were never resolved, never addressed, never healed for them. And these become the motivation for how we begin to look into our future. So part of what I began to see was that the Oslo peace process was actually a negotiation process that was built from a place of fear of the other. Not out of respecting the other. Not out of honoring the other. Not out of recognizing that there, there were injustices that were done to the other. I am afraid of from you. Either I kill you or try to find a agreement between us and you that you want to kill me. But I'll make sure that whatever this agreement is, I stay strong in it. This is what Oslo was about at the end of the day. Part of our journey has continued to also begin to ask the question, which is, what is the role of religion? And so as an organization, referring to the healing work, we have now established programs that really look into how do we bring healing into the communities. How do we develop leaders in the community that can really speak a language of true peace, reconcili reconciliation, and healing of ourselves, of our wounds, and of the other, in order to really achieve a real sense of peace and justice in the land. But a very important target group in this equation is a target group that has also been marginalized from the political process, which is the religious voice. The Oslo peace process did something that was very important and not many people focus on. It purposely marginalized the religious voice from the negotiations themselves. Secular leaders on both sides said, religion is the problem, we take religion out of the equation, then as if we take the problem out of the equation and we could create a secular peace process between us and we will push that secular peace process and everybody has to accept it. The religious voice was not included. Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. 
And if we really look into those people who we claim as terrorists, who we claim as those who fought against the peace process, who were the rejectionists of the peace process, especially within the, the Muslim and the Jewish community, you will find out that many of them were motivated by religion. Agree with or not agree with how they interpreted religion, but religion was a motivation for how they related to this conflict and how they related to peace. We were sharing earlier, before, about how the person who actually killed Ishaq Rabin, the Israeli Jew who killed Ishaq Rabin, was fully embedded and motivated by the fact that Rabin was a traitor to the faith. And therefore, he had to be eliminated. And again, you find on both sides people engaging in violence, using religion as an excuse. But I would actually say the fact that religion was not included created that space for them to become violent. This is how their voice was heard. And so part of what we are looking into now is asking the question, what is the role of religion and faith in peace? If we are able to look into the traumas of the past and heal those traumas, if we are able to look and really look into the religious texts of the three religious communities, then what is that potential that can be created uh, for the future? And I would honestly say, with all the difficulties that exist there, I'm not in any way trying to draw a beautiful picture of anything in the land, because hatred and resentment and anger and violence still are the leading discourse, there are voices that are beginning to emerge from these religious leaders that are beginning to say, we need to bring that voice back into the equation. I want to end by, by referring also, because of just my faith background, to one of these, the, the verses from the Bible that has become sort of my own slogan in how I do my work. And for me to begin to understand that peace work, when it comes to conflict, is not necessarily about achieving a political solution. Many of us, especially if you're an activist for peace and justice in Palestine, or peace in Palestine and Israel, many of us have been duped, including myself, for many years in fighting for the political solution. Ultimately, there has to be a political framework, because we live in nation-state structures, where we need to have some framework that is political. But I think one of the things that is missing is the fact that we need to engage in how do we really understand, how do we bring peace between communities? How do we bring healing into the communities? How do we bring justice? How do we build relationships that are built on mutual trust and respect between them so that these communities can trust each other, respect each other, to really negotiate the right political solution to this conflict. And so for me, looking back into the story of Jesus, and one of the questions I began to ask, well, when Jesus wasn't walking on water and feeding 5,000 people, what did he do the rest of his time? And the verse that has become sort of my motivation is Matthew 4.23, which actually answers this question. And Matthew 4.23 says that Jesus walked through the Galilee, which is what he did. He was preaching in their synagogues, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing their illnesses and ailments. And so we've taken these three words, healing, teaching, and preaching. I know many people don't like the word preaching. Another interpretation for the word preaching is ushering in the kingdom. And so part of the dynamics that we look into and then this is my encouragement in the work that you are doing here in Bristol when it comes to how are you engaging in peace work in diverse communities. The first component is how do we look towards the past. We could look towards the past in criticism. We could look towards the past in blame, in complaint, in pointing our finger in not taking responsibility, they are responsible for what happened. We can do this. We will do this all the time. We do this with our wives, with our children, and with our communities. But there's a component called healing. How can we heal the traumas of the past? Because the traumas of the past, what they do to communities is they create shackles that prevent these communities from living out what they are meant to live out in their humanity. When Jesus healed, 
you know, we could say that he did it to show off how great he is. But part of what he did was to liberate people. The process of liberation actually happens when you heal people from the traumas of their past. And as I said, in our context, we are communities that are overflowing with traumas. So part of the work that we need to do is how do we heal the past the second component is how do we teach? He was teaching in their synagogue, he was teaching in their universities, in their institutions, like this one. Teaching skills of how these communities should live their lives after they are healed. After you are free from prison, you need to learn a skill, right? Because you become responsible. And then ultimately, which is about what is the vision of peace that we seek. And the vision of peace that we seek in this land, and we work with Jews, Christians, and Muslims. We work with secular, we work with religious. We work with settlers. We work with Islamic political groups. And you could name them in whatever way you want. We work with all people in saying, what is a vision of peace in this land that we could all feel we are part of? Not enforced upon us. What does it mean to live in dignity, in respect, and honor in the whole of that? What does it mean for a Jew to say, that I have come back to this land and I'm actually living the covenant, which is to be agents of justice and righteousness, to be a light to all nations, to treat the stranger as equal, one law. This is part of biblical teaching, the Torah. What does it mean for the Christians to understand the teachings of Jesus in the land? And what does it mean for the Muslims in the community to really understand the true concepts of Islam and how these tenets are lived out in the community. And so I want to end by encouraging you, as you are engaging in this work here in your communities, to, to begin to see how you perceive the other. How you perceive even the action of the other, and define them by their action. And to begin to ask different sets of questions. What does it really mean to build community? What does it really mean to build peace? What does it mean that we all live in equality and justice in this land? Thank you for your listening. Thank you for all those questions. Thank you to Sami for responding to them. I know that there's probably loads more questions, loads more comments that could be made. Um, but as I said at the beginning, we're going to finish this formal part of the evening by hearing some, about something that's much closer to home, that draws on the same principles of building bridges between communities where there has often been mistrust and tension. And here to tell us about this project, project is Rabbi Monique Meyer, who is Rabbi at the Progressive Synagogue here in Bristol, and also a faith advisor for the Multi-Faith Chaplaincy. And also Kalsoon Bashir, who, amongst a number of other things, is co-director of Inspire, an organisation supporting the rights of Muslim women in the UK, and also Muslim chaplain at the university. So, right now, I'd like to invite you both to come if you'd like to come and stand where I am. Thank you. Shalom, salam. Um, thank you for asking me to come and be part of this. Um, first of all, I just want to reiterate, I am Jewish. I'm not Israeli. I don't live in Israel-Palestine. I can't presume what it might be like to live there. Um, and even if I were Israeli, I couldn't speak for all Israelis, because there's that's not monolithic. And I also can't presume to speak for all Jews, because we have quite a diversity of opinions. We're also, as a people, not monolithic. And furthermore, even though I'm a rabbi in the progressive synagogue here, I can't speak from my community. I'm only one voice. Um, I'm speaking from my own perspective. When two armies are locked in battle, the place where the struggle takes place is called the front line. This line is drawn at the place where the two forces meet. On either side, there is a territory that belongs to that side 
and is thus not the location of the battle. The front line moves and changes, but battle, generally speaking, occurs only where the two sides meet. Our moral choices can be thought of in a similar way. There are decisions that we have made in our lives so many times that they are no longer decisions. And this is from a paraphrase from um, Eliyahu Dessler, who was a rabbi, a scholar, and a Jewish philosopher of the 20th century. What I find interesting about this quotation in relation to Bristol is that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not here, and yet we, too, can become so entrenched in our perspectives that we are unable to choose to respond instead of just reacting. As a rabbi and a Jew of deep faith, I profoundly believe what we are taught in the book of Genesis, that Vayivra Elohim et ha'adam b'tzalmo, God created humankind in God's image, so because we are all created in God's image, we must treat each and every person with the honor and the respect that they deserve. And yet, when we stop listening, we no longer see the other person as an equally valuable human being with their own concerns and fears and needs. After a meeting of the Bristol Multi-Faith Forum in July 2014, a number of us a number of us from various faith communities talked about the need to do something because of the explosion of conflict between Palestinians and Israelis that summer. I floated the idea of a vigil for peace, but afterwards reconsidered that idea because I believed that we needed to do something different. We needed to help start a conversation because I felt like there was no authentic dialogue in Bristol. There were like-minded people protesting and organizing vigils, but there were no conversations facilitating understanding. In London, I attended a very moving interfaith program with prayers and song and storytelling, and the people who came together wanted to move away from the polarized thinking dominating news, social media, personal conversations, and wanted to move towards compassion, understanding, and authentic dialogue. I spoke with my friend, Hani Smith, at the British Friends of the Bereaved Families Forum, an organization that promotes dialogue and understanding through Palestinian and Israeli individuals coming together. And she suggested I show the two-sided story, which follows 27 Israelis and Palestinians who met together, and the deepening conversations it's not an easy film. I don't know, were any of you at that when we put that program on? Did any of you attend that? I know you did, Eric. Anybody else? Okay, so just one here. Um, it's not an easy film. And what I found was that each time I viewed the film, ultimately four times, my perception shifted about the various participants. So with each watching, something different happened in my own mind. Viewing it also reinforced my belief that the most important thing for us to do in Bristol is to have open, facilitated conversations that enable us to move beyond right and wrong polarization and into more nuanced conversations of sensitivity and respect of each other as human beings. I think that key is to continue to talk and build understanding. Indeed, Rabbi Tarfon taught us in the Ethics of the Fathers you are not expected to complete the task, but neither are you free to exempt yourself from, your, from it or, indeed, avoid it. So with that in mind, every day I offer a prayer. May the one who makes peace in the heavens make peace and nurture understanding amongst us here in Bristol as well as those in Israel and Palestine. Amen. If there's to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. And if there's to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. And if there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. And if there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. And if there's to be peace in the home, 
there must be peace in the heart. Peace radiates outwards, and in order for it to take root, we all bear a responsibility to impact within our sphere of influence. Increasing parts of the world are becoming battlegrounds, and although distant, these war zones and areas of conflict are brought into our homes and play upon our emotions, testing the tolerance that has traditionally been at the forefront of our communities in the United Kingdom. Our Jewish neighbours fear that they're being held to account for offence far beyond their control. And similarly, Muslim communities here feel under threat from those who want to blame them for the actions of others. The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the summer of 2014 brought protest marches and a peace vigil to our city amid tensions between different communities right across the country. Many felt it was right to protest, but also felt at ease at things that they were hearing and felt that the climate was right for misunderstanding. I felt that it was not acceptable that there were those that felt fearful of people like me, Muslims, because of the protest, and that I could not allow that to take root and fester. I accepted the invitation to be a facilitator at the two-sided dialogue events, not because I was an expert on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, in fact far from it, but because I felt a personal obligation to do what I could do to bring neighbours together to help humanise one another, and in doing so challenge the dehumanisation of the other. In facilitating dialogue, we were clear we were not facilitating a debate. This to, was to be a conversation in which the participants' primary goal was to pursue mutual understanding rather than agreement or immediate solutions. We hoped it would be an opportunity to learn about the perspective of others and that participants were able to reflect upon their own views. I'm not going to put on any rose-coloured spectacles and say that it was easy or without challenge. Members, members of Bristol's Muslim communities were low in attendance, but they were represented, and that, I felt, was a start. We made it clear that we were not there to solve the problem, but hopes, concerns, fears and frustrations were shared, listened to, and heard. It was a solid foundation upon which we could move forward, and I'm pleased that the work of the Multi-Faith Forum and Salam Shalom in the city continues. Why I took part, despite my personal reservations, can be summed up in a story from Islamic tradition that I'd like to share with you. It's Prophet Ibrahim, story of Prophet Ibrahim upon him in peace and the small bird. When Prophet Ibrahim was thrown into the fire for, for refusing to worship idols, a small bird was taking a drop of water and dashing towards the fire. A crow asked the bird what he would do with that drop of water. The fire was massive, and a mere drop of water wasn't going to make any difference. <coughs> the bird replied that on the Day of Judgment, God would question him of what he had done to extinguish the fire in which Prophet Abraham was thrown. And he said, I'm sure God will not ask me whether I managed to put out the fire or not, but God will ask me what I did to stop the fire. The fact was that the fire wouldn't get any colder, but at least his drop of water, his responsibility, and his contributions were there. And I want to feel that my contribution has been there in Bristol. Thank you.